Now, I'd like to read a number of short passages, first of all in Hebrews and chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, and we're going to read at verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now over to the Old Testament, to Genesis and chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28, and we're going to read at verse 12. And he, that is Jacob, of course, dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Verse number 15, and behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee, until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Now to the book of Joshua, please, in chapter 1. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 1, and reading at verse 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Verse 5, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And finally, to 1 Chronicles in chapter 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 20. How's your connection? That's not great. And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. And we look to God to indeed bless to us the reading of his good word this evening. <clears throat> now we are living, we would have to say, in strange days. Days unprecedented, no doubt, in the experience of every one of us. Challenging days that it seems are likely to continue on for some time yet. And with the pandemic, I guess we might say there are some who perhaps have anxiety as to what the coming winter months might hold for us. Again, in relation to the economic downturn, no doubt there are others who have anxiety regarding business affairs. For others, the threat of unemployment, and yet for others, perhaps concern about financial matters. But over against all those challenges and all those concerns, let's not forget that as the people of God, we have in the language of 1 Peter 2 verse 4, chapter 1 verse 4, been given exceeding great and precious promises. And tonight I want to just remind you of one of those promises. Turning back a few pages in our Bible, 
we come to the lovely words in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, where the writer says, Be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That we discover is the second actually of two exhortations that are embraced in the verse. Exhortations that might be summarized like this simply don't covet, be content. The writer says, let your conversation be without covetousness. The word translated covetousness is actually used just twice in the New Testament. The other reference comes in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3, where regarding elders, one necessary qualification is not covetous. It is certainly not the usual word for covetousness used in the Bible. The usual word that denotes simply the desire to have more. But the one which is used in Hebrews 13 verse 5, it means literally to love, the love of money. Mr. Darby, for instance, renders it like this, let your conversation be without love of money. Now we shouldn't think that the writer is seeking to, shall we say, squash any ambition a person might have to, shall we say, improve their lot in life. Neither in saying that is he condemning material gain. But really the thrust of the verse, the statement is this. It's a warning. Less discontentment with our lot, coupled with love of money, should intrude into our character and conduct. Think for a moment about the love of money. You know, it's sobering to consider what damage that has wrought over the centuries. You remember, for instance, the confession of Achan back in Joshua chapter 7, verses 20 to 22. He said this, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. It's interesting that twice in that chapter, it is stated that the silver was placed at the bottom of the stash. We know, of course, the outcome that Achan's conduct, it introduced sin into the camp of Israel, leading to their defeat at the hands of the men of Ai. Achan's covetousness introduced uncleanness into the camp. So how careful we need to be. And think of another man, Gehazi, Elisha's servant. In 2 Kings 5, you remember that when Naaman returned to Elisha, following his cleansing from leprosy, having washed himself seven times in the river Jordan. He said to the prophet in verse 15, 2 Kings 5, I pray thee take a blessing of thy servant. But we know that Elisha refused. He would have certainly have Naaman appreciate that the cleansing was all of grace. It was a free gift from God. But you remember as the narrative unfolds, Gehazi follows after Naaman. He makes up a plausible story and he 
acquired for himself two talents of silver, two changes of garments. He acquired what? He coveted. But with that, he got something he never desired. You remember that when he got back to Elisha, Elisha said, the leprosy of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. The consequence of Naaman's covetousness, it affected not only himself, but it affected his whole family. And think of yet another example, Judas. Remember in John chapter 12, following the anointing of the feet of Jesus, we read in verse 4, Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold? For 300 pence and given to the poor. This he said. Not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. And we know how his covetousness, it issued in his betraying the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. You know, as we think of the three incidents, well might the writer of Hebrews say to us, don't covet. But then we have the positive exhortation. The second exhortation, as he says, be content with such things as ye have. The word that's translated content it is used in Luke chapter 3, verse 14, in connection with wages. John the Baptist saying to the soldiers that came to him, be content with your wages. In 1 Timothy 6, and it's used in relation to food and raiment. Having food and raiment, be therewith content. So instead of a spirit of covetousness, for that which we haven't got, there should be a spirit of contentment with us for that which we do have. Now bearing in mind the Jewish setting of this epistle, we might notice that this matter of contentment, it was something that Abraham manifests. Do you remember back in Genesis 14, verse 21, his words to the king of Sodom, take the goods to thyself. A little later in the chapter, he says this, I will not take anything that is thine. And we see a spirit of contentment in relation to Abraham. Not just Abraham. You remember, I'm sure, the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. But isn't it interesting that the Apostle says it was something that he had to learn. I have learned in whatever state I am, whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Now, before we leave the two exhortations, don't covet, be content. You know, it's very instructive to just consider the those to whom the epistle was initially addressed. Do we think perhaps that we are living in challenging days? Then consider the circumstances of those to whom the Hebrew epistle was 
initially addressed. Back in chapter 10, verse 34, speaking about them, doesn't the writer say this? Ye took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. And since they had suffered thus, we might infer that what they had now was little in comparison to what they once had. Yet the writer says, don't covet, be content with such things as ye have. Now, having looked at that, we might say, well, what did they have that should obviously produce within them this spirit of contentment? Well, verse 5 continues. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake sake thee. What they had was the promise of the Lord's presence with them. With the result, verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. We might say as we look at the two verses, what a promise and what a blessing. Now think for a moment about the promise. First of all, consider the person making the promise. He has said. And then the content of the promise, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Who was it who gave the promise? Read literally, the verse reads like this. He himself hath said. So there is obviously a very definite emphasis upon the person who has made this promise. And if we trace back this reference, the pronoun, he, then it refers back to verse 4, where you'll notice the writer has said a rather different setting, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So the pronoun, pronoun in verse 5, it refers to God in verse 4. God in all his fullness. What we can say who is omnipotent, nothing is too hard for him. What we can say who is omniscient, nothing is hid from him. And one who is omnipresent. Of whom you remember the psalmist says in Psalm 46 verse 1, a very present help in time of trouble. Now he himself hath said, God who in the words of Titus 1 verse 2 cannot lie. And we might just add this, that actually the statement is in the present tense. It literally reads like this, he is saying, which means it is as relevant today as ever it was. Be content with such things as ye have, for he is saying. Now what of the promise itself? I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. It might seem, I suppose, initially that the two statements are saying virtually the same thing. There is, however, a distinction between them. The word leave, amongst other meanings, the Greek word has the idea to give up, to loosen hold, 
to let sink. The word translated forsake, amongst other meanings, it has the idea to leave in straits, to, to leave helpless, to abandon. To get the difference, maybe we could just illustrate it like this. Apply to the figure of a father and his child. In the first, we might think of the hold the father has on the hand of the child, as perhaps he seeks to just guide him across a busy road or junction. And naturally, the father is holding the child's hand very firmly. And here God says, I will not loosen hold on you. In the second little statement, we might think of the father who whatever problems the child comes into, he stands faithfully by him, cannot leave him in the lurch. And so God says, I will not abandon you. What a lovely promise that is. In both statements, we might observe that in the Greek text, they are emphatic negative statements. Lord is saying this, I will never, never, or I will in no wise leave thee, nor ever, ever, or in any wise forsake thee. And again, will you just notice the very personal character of that promise? It is personal. It is individual. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. As we said, what a lovely promise. May we learn to live in the good and enjoyment of it. Now imagine for a moment that you will say are Jewish and you are reading this epistle for the first time. You belong to a nation that has had a long history of and a long experience of God's dealings with the nation. A nation that has been entrusted with the oracles of God. And so you're looking, we'll say, at this statement in Hebrews 13. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And it could well be that the very promise might cause you to remember others in the nation. Others in the nation's history who'd been given very similar words. And so we begin to turn back to look at some of the individuals within the Jewish nation. We come back to Genesis chapter 28. And we're looking at something in the history of Jacob. In Genesis 28, verse 15. We read these words, the Lord is speaking to him, Behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee, until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So here's a man. Who we might say he was given a very similar promise. The Lord saying, I am with thee, I will not leave thee. Now, when was that promise given to Jacob? We all remember the narrative, I'm sure, in Genesis 28. Jacob was leaving home on account of his brother Esau's determination to slay him. 
we might say, as far as Jacob was concerned. The future uncertain, unknown. No longer would there be an Isaac and a Rebecca to fall back on. Wouldn't be any mobile phone to ring home. Wouldn't be any Skype. <laughs> But the Lord says, I am with thee, I will not leave thee. Would not only the promise, but also the situation have significance for the first Jewish readers of the Hebrew epistle? Think for a moment of their situation. What is the thrust of the teaching of the epistle? Well, you might say, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, the writer says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Those first readers had been brought up in Judaism. A faith, we could say, divinely given, Con containing the first principles of the doctrine of Christ. A faith that anticipated the coming of the Messiah, and which in its teaching laid a foundation of repentance and faith in God. But now, of course, Christ had come. The readers had received him as their saviour. I believe that. But it had not been without his problems. Having professed faith in Christ, we were thinking a little earlier, they encountered opposition. They experienced persecution. They endured the spoiling of their goods. They had come so far. Now the challenge is this, were they prepared to move on? To leave behind them the first principles of Judaism with its material temple, its animal sacrifices, its ordained priesthood to leave all that and to embrace the Christian faith in all its fullness. In the language of Hebrews 6, to go on unto perfection. That word perfection, it's already been used in chapter 5. And verse 14, where it is translated full age in regard to spiritual maturity. And you'll see the challenge of the letter. It is, are they prepared to go on, to leave behind the earthly temple, the animal sacrifices, the ordained priesthood, to go on to spiritual maturity. After chapter 6, verse 1, and the, exhort and the exhortation, the words perfection and perfect begin to appear quite frequently in the Hebrew epistle. In chapter 7, verse 11, contrasting Christ's priesthood with Aaron's priesthood. In chapter 9, verse 11, contrasting Judaism's sanctuary on earth with the heavenly sanctuary. In chapter 10, verse 14, contrasting the one sacrifice of Christ with the many sacrifices under the old covenant. And it all culminates in chapter 13, where the writer, having mentioned that Christ suffered without the gate, 
the gate of Jerusalem, that is historically, he exhorts his readers, that was verse 12 in verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach, stepping outside the camp of Judaism, going forth unto him. Now the readers of that epistle, we might say much like Jacob in Genesis 28, they stood, we might say, on the border of territory they knew and territory they'd been at home in with all of the visible material things associated with Judaism. But now they're being called to leave it. As Jacob was leaving home in Genesis 28 through force of circumstances. But as for Jacob, so for them, the promise comes, I am with thee, I will not leave thee. You know, we like Jacob in Genesis 28. We can have Bethel moments. By that I mean this. When it becomes necessary to leave behind, to leave behind the life we have known and step out into something we don't know. Not easy. But we do have his promise, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So then we just recall Jacob and the promise that was given him. But then our thoughts perhaps move on a little bit. And we begin to think about Joshua. And we come to Joshua chapter 1 verse 5 where the Lord says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. So we got the promise again. I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. I want you to notice how that chapter opens. It opens with a twofold reminder of the death of Moses. Verse 1 says, now after the death of Moses. Then in verse 2, the Lord speaking to Joshua says, Moses my servant is dead. I won't reverse two indicates there was some speculation. Speculation amongst the people as to whether Moses was dead or not. You remember that event is recorded back in Deuteronomy 34. And the end of verse six says this, no man knoweth of his, that's Moses' sepulchre, and to this day was there some speculation in the camp was moses dead or not well the lord here in verse 2 he confirms it moses is dead now think for a moment what that meant for the children of israel would some have been tempted to think, well, just as they were about to enter the land of Canaan, they needed the leadership of Moses more than ever. 
know, if you go back to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we get in chapter 34, verse 10, we're told there arose not a servant, not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses. And a threefold tribute is given to him. Four times in Joshua chapter 1, Moses is described as being the servant of the Lord. By the Lord himself, verse 2, then in the narrative, verse 1, verse 13, and verse 15. And maybe the children of Israel might have thought that needed the leadership of Moses at this difficult, critical moment. But Moses was dead. The departure of Moses reminds us that even great men die. And of course, with his death, a successor was needed. And Joshua was the man divinely appointed to lead the people into the promised land. You can observe that although Moses was dead, there was no change in God's plan. It was still his purpose, as Josh, the book of Joshua opens, still his purpose that the people should be given the land of Canaan. Not only was there no change in divine purpose, there was no change in relation to his presence. And so the Lord says to Joshua, I will be with thee, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Moses had gone, but God remained. And in fact, in verse 5, the Lord says to Joshua, As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. So Joshua had lost the company of Moses, but he could still know the power and divine help that Moses had known. So as you come down the chapter, verse 9, the Lord says, Be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Why? For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Jacob had the promise. Now Joshua has the promise. Now I want you again to think about the initial Jewish readers of the Hebrew epistle. Hadn't they experienced the loss of godly leaders? The writer in chapter 13, verses 7, verse 8, he says, Remember them that have, literally it should be in the past tense, remember them that had the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. For Joshua, Moses had gone, but God remained. For the Hebrew readers, those godly elders had been called home, but Christ remained. There's an emphasis in the Greek text upon the word same. Mr. Darby brings it out like this by reading it, Jesus Christ is the same. The epistle began with an assertion of Christ's eternal being. Do you remember chapter 1 verse 12 in a quotation from Psalm 102, Thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. The epistle closes on a similar note. 
So chapter 13, verse 8, speaking of Christ, the writer says the same yesterday. He was the one in whom the elders of the past day found their resources and the strength to speak the word of God, to walk by faith, to live for Christ. The same yesterday, then regard to the present, the same today. When you'd been to those godly leaders in the past day, and to believers today, we look back over the years, we can no doubt think of men <coughs> and women who served God well and whose life and whose ministry touched our own life. But the God that they knew, we can know. The power they experienced, we can experience to speak, to walk and to live for Christ. The same yesterday, today, and then we read forever. The eternal, unchanging one on whom we can depend, whatever future days might hold for us. You know, the late W. W. Faraday summarizing perhaps the basic lesson of the verse. He said this, let us not live in the past. Lamenting of former days were better than these. But let us rather lay hold upon God for today, assured that we shall find him as good to us as ever he was to his saints in past ages. We might perhaps view with some trep trepidation future days. But we have his promise. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Jacob had the promise. Joshua had that promise. And now as we survey our Old Testament scriptures, we think of perhaps another man. We think about Solomon. To whom David said, we read it, 1 Chronicles 28, 20, in words that really have an echo of Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, David says, be strong and of good courage, and do it, fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. So Solomon had that same promise given to him. And what was the occasion? Well, in context, David said this, if we go back a few verses, in verse 5 we are reminded that Solomon had been chosen to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. In verse 9 of the chapter, David exhorts Solomon to know and serve the Lord to uh, to know to serve the Lord and the context is this he had a work to do in verse 10 Solomon was chosen to build a house for the Lord in verses 11 to 13 David commits to Solomon the pattern for the house and its courts a divine pattern, verse 19. Now that's the context. To build the house 
of the Lord. David, who initially desired to do it, who had prepared and gathered materials for it, would not be there to oversee it. But the promise is given. The Lord will be with thee, Solomon. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. For Solomon, that house, of course, was a material house, the temple at Jerusalem. In these days, God's house, of course, is a spiritual house. Hebrews 3, 6, doesn't the writer say, speaking of Christ as a son, over his own house, whose house are we? And wasn't there work for the readers of the epistle to do? Chapter 6, verse 10, doesn't the writer say, God's not unrighteous? To forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. In chapter 10, verse 24, he says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Doesn't he speak in chapter 12, 28 of serving the Lord uh, acceptably with reverence and godly fear? In chapter 13, verse 16, do good to do good and to communicate, forget not. And finally, in chapter 13, verse 21, doesn't he pray, God make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. There is work to be done. Does the responsibility seem da daunting? Do we feel, for instance, so much work to do? So many needs to address? So much to discourage? So many difficulties, but he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Notice what follows that lovely promise. The writer says, Hebrews 13, 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Jane Darby again renders it like this. So that taking courage, we may say, and two things are mentioned. Taking courage, we may say, the Lord is my helper. It's really a quotation from Psalm 118, verse 6. And the quotation reads like this, The Lord is on my side. Taking courage, we may say, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And again, if we go back to the quotation, we get this idea, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The latter part being a question. And really the psalmist is saying, since the Lord is on my side, <laughs> no man can do anything to me independent of the sovereign will of him who is my helper. Interesting, isn't it? In verse 5, we have what he has said. In verse 6, 
what we may say. Now those first Jewish readers, they might, as we've suggested, easily see certain parallels between themselves, the position of Jacob, Genesis 28, the position of Joshua, Joshua 1, the position of Solomon, 1 Chronicles 28, and what better encouragement could there be than to remember that the promise given to Jacob, to Joshua and Solomon is equally true in regard to themselves. He has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You know, just looking at the three again, we could say Jacob was about to leave the land. Lord says, I will be with thee. Joshua was about to enter the land. The Lord says, I will be with thee. Solomon had a work to do in the land. The Lord says, I will be with thee. Then looking at the circumstances of each man, you will likely conclude that for each one, the promise was given at a critical moment in their life. And each man found God's promise to be true. Now he did say, brethren and sisters, that we are in days unique in our experience. But let's be encouraged tonight. We are not alone. He himself hath promised. Shall we pray?